right, Phil, it looks like we got a really good group here today. So I'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Charlie Waterman with the CFA Society Atlanta. Uh, welcome to our online series, Introduction to DeFi. Before we get started, I just want to go over some quick upcoming events that I thought are worth highlighting. On November 9th, we have our annual conferment dinner to congratulate our new CFA charter holders. That's from 5.30 to 8 p.m. On November 14th, we have a member community book club event where they're discussing a, a very interesting book from 5 to 6 p.m. that day. We also have another member community event and investment strategy roundtable on November 15th from 5 to 6 p.m. And lastly, on December 7th, we get to relax and socialize with each other at the annual holiday party and networking social. That's from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. on December 7th. So please check the CFA Atlanta website for more details on these and other programs, and please register today. So today we're, we have uh, Philip Moran. He is co-founder and CEO of DigOp. Prior to being full-time in digital assets, Phil was portfolio manager of absolute return strategies at a $50 billion US pension fund. He specializes in identifying and constructing uncorrelated alpha seeking return streams. He is a CFA charter holder and holds a degree in economics from Kennesaw State University. Just a quick housekeeping note, please submit your questions via the Q&A feature within the Zoom controls at the bottom of your screen. And with that, Phil, I'll turn it over to you. Please go ahead. Thanks so much for joining us. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Charlie. And hey, everybody, thanks for joining this webinar on Introduction to DeFi, a deep dive into 2022. Uh, quick disclaimer there. Um, yeah. And thanks for the introduction, Charlie. But uh, once again, my name is Phil Moran. I'm co-founder and CEO of uh, DigOp or Digital Opportunities Group. A bit about what we do. Uh, we run an absolute return style hedge fund utilizing digital assets, both across CFI or centralized finance and DeFi or decentralized finance, uh, where we have no bias to be long or short the asset class uh, systematically. Um, and we seek to deliver an uncorrelated alpha producing return stream to investors. Uh, as Charlie mentioned, I was previously at a, at a large U.S. pension plan uh, where I managed uh, myself a little over $3 billion allocating to absolute return style strategies. So these would have been things like equity market neutral, uh, short term trading, uh, global macro style strategies, this kind of thing. And I'm also a chartered financial analyst. Before uh, I even give background on what we're going to talk about today, uh, what is it that I hope you take away from this? Uh, one, DeFi is really a rethinking of some core financial products uh, with no middlemen, uh, giving users ultimate control over their assets. Two, the accelerated shakeout in 2022, which we're going to go into, um, within these markets, has shown us what protocols are properly constructed and provides a framework for what reasonably works. And, and this shakeout uh, can give us an idea for what comes next for DeFi protocol development. And one thing I will mention here, you'll hear me using this term DeFi protocol. Uh, you'll hear me saying that a lot. Uh, this is really synonymous with product. So DeFi protocol, DeFi product um, really means the same thing. But that said, so that said, that the shakeout can give us an idea of what comes next. Uh, sort of a side takeaway that I think is useful for allocators especially is that it seems reasonable to believe that there is a degree of survivorship bias uh, created for those looking to allocate to uh, perhaps fund managers or, or others who consume these DeFi products. Uh, the headline risks you may have seen like Celsius or Three Years Capital really mask uh, just how bad things got. And this is, this is really based on, on anecdotal evidence that the impact of, of the sort of collapses through the year extended to uh, funds, corporate treasuries, uh, uh, protocol treasuries uh, that really didn't make the mainstream headlines. So in the hopes of making this as informative as possible, instead of providing you a scientific taxonomy 
of various concepts in the space, I'd instead like to tell the story of 2022. And instead of providing just a generic description of the timeline, instead telling the story from our point of view as asset managers who are directly involved in these markets uh, and directly involved in these products uh, over the course of this year, the hope is that we can provide an instructive perspective and really a story that uh, you all, uh, as financial market professionals, uh, a story that you can inject yourselves into as we go through this story of uh, blockchain capital flows and interest rates. So to be clear, once again, this is not an academic lecture. We're going to condense a lot of events. Nuance will be lost, but my objective is to provide you with a framework for what questions to ask next. And of course, we're happy to go over that during the Q&A today. Uh, or even separately, if you'd like to reach out to us uh, separately. So that said, let's dive into January of 2022. And let's set the stage with this price chart of the largest digital asset, Bitcoin. So the crypto market is positive, but shaky. Bitcoin at this point in January is down 38% from all-time highs, but over 450% over the last two years, over this span. Even with this recent shock, optimism is still high and elation hasn't left the market. If you were involved in the markets in this time, you might've been in uh, Discord channels. You might've been on Twitter. Uh, you would be seeing uh, messages or even memes where you, the, you could really see the elation was palpable at the time. In Ethereum, a blockchain enabling computational logic or smart contracts be executed in a trustless way has given birth to decentralized finance or DeFi. DeFi first took off in the summer of 2020 by offering huge yields, and it has by now attracted institutions as well as investors. Hundreds of billions of dollars of capital have entered the ecosystem, and it wasn't just Ethereum at this point. There were dozens of blockchains all vying for these capital flows, all vying for these dollars that, are, that float on these blockchains. This chart shows TVL or total value locked within DeFi. This is a measure of the value of assets brought onto blockchains. And you can see that by this point in the timeline, that value had reached nearly $250 billion. Because you see DeFi is really just a breed of new financial products, as I mentioned in the takeaways earlier. And like any financial product, the thing that makes DeFi more useful is liquidity. And the hunger for liquidity is massive. So in order to incentivize funds to come on chain, an interest rate game called liquidity mining was created. Liquidity mining, is where liquidity providers lend uh, or deposit their assets onto a decentralized finance protocol or, or product in exchange for a share of the fees generated plus a token incentive. And this token incentive portion was paid out in a cryptocurrency itself. And you may have heard liquidity mining described uh, really disparaged as a sort of like a black box. Uh, this money box, something like this. I don't think that's quite a fair description because there are traditional market um, analogs. Uh, think about a bank. Uh, a bank will offer an interest rate on savings accounts so that it can incentivize those with capital to deposit those funds into a savings account so then that they can then lend out that capital. Similarly, Within uh, DeFi, lending protocols like Aave or Compound Finance offer yields to depositors in order to incentivize those assets to flow onto the product, onto the protocol. Uh, similarly, like the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ or other traditional market exchanges might offer fee rebates to market makers uh, to provide liquidity, so too, uh, in DeFi, Uniswap or SushiSwap decentralized exchanges uh, allowed users to participate in swap fees and also provided them a token incentive. 
So of course, as this capital flowed onto a decentralized exchange, it would lower the slippage the same way that the, uh, a traditional market exchange wants to incentivize market makers to bring that capital, uh, making the markets operate better, lowering slippage. And all of this, of course, is done with that uh, DeFi promise of assets remaining in your control, secured by cryptography and mathematics. So as an example, uh, this is a chart from our internal on-chain yield system. Uh, we call it Spike. Uh, so we scrape this liquidity mining yield data from over a dozen blockchains. We build out these, these intraday data sets. Um, and this is a time series of the yields on a liquidity mining opportunity where you could deposit to stable coins. And so stable coins, these are cryptocurrencies that are pegged to the value of the dollar. Uh, in, in this case, uh, the two stable coins are USDC and DAI. So you could take these two stable coins, deposit them into this protocol, and then you'd be uh, provided a yield. You would generate this yield. Uh, the thing to pay attention to on this chart is the red line. So the red line is the uh, aggregate annualized yield that you would generate by participating in this opportunity. And so you can see that it was often in the high teens. And I guess just to, in case some of these numbers are, are fairly small, the x-axis down here, the timestamps, this is from December of 2021 to mid-January 2022. So to give you an idea of what some of these yields look like at the time. And so you can see this stable coin opportunity, you could go generate at times in the teens, high teens, interest rates on your just straight up dollars. And believe it or not, this was actually one of the less attractive opportunities at the time. So this is our background for entering the year as we move into uh, the next few months and into the second quarter. So as these first few months rolled on, these capital inflows created increased competition for yield, as you can imagine. So that chart of TVL that we showed earlier, that hockey stick looking chart where those assets flowed in, you can imagine that as more and more capital flowed in, this led to more competition to try to go get that yield. This led to yield compression. And so as you would expect, this drove people out on the risk spectrum. So here we show a visual uh, that we had put together. We were trying to demonstrate to folks just how competitive the liquidity mining game uh, was becoming. Uh, so uh, what this chart is, this is a chart showing how long it took for a given liquidity mining opportunity to have its yield cut in half. Because you see the liquidity mining game was you would go deposit your funds, your stable coins typically, into one of these liquidity mining pools, one of these liquidity mining opportunities where you would then generate this yield, but then that yield would eventually decline and you'd have to go to the next one and the next one and the next one. So what this chart is showing is how long it took for the yield at a given opportunity to have its yield been cut in half. And so you can see as the year started in January, it took about 13 days thereabouts, so about two weeks, let's call it, for the yield to get cut in half at a given opportunity. But then as the year rolled on, this came all the way down to uh, really, as we came into the first part of the, the second quarter, uh, this came down all the way to about five days thereabout. So, you can clearly see that increasing competition that I mentioned. You can see how market participants could be forced out on the risk spectrum as they had to work harder and harder to extract that yield as they had to bounce from protocol to protocol to protocol. And it's not hard to imagine now uh, folks, market participants, relaxing their underwriting standards if they had any at all. And this increase in competition eventually began to make weird things happen. So in the spirit of Halloween around the corner, there were bumps in the night. So for example, now I wanna be clear that this example I'm going to show you, this is not like some kind of uh, systematically important asset we're about to go over. This this. This asset I'm about, I'm about to give an example of did attract uh, a couple hundred million dollars of capital, but it was not it was not systemically important. But it does give us a really interesting um, sort of microcosmic representation of what was going on at the time. 
So this example, it's a protocol called Tomb Finance. It created an asset pegged to another cryptocurrency via this arbitrage mechanism. And it had been offering, the protocol Tomb, Tomb Finance, had been offering massive yields in order to compensate liquidity miners to deposit their capital to maintain this peg. And this chart shows the yield that you generate from doing this. So some of these numbers might be small, but if you can see them, your eyes are not fooling you. You can see at times this yield did in fact approach 450% annualized yields at times. And so uh, again, just to uh, read off some of these numbers, the x-axis, the time here goes from uh, September of 2021, showing it to uh, late March, early April of, of 2022. So in order to get this yield payment, which, as I said, peaked at, at 450% at times, but then even in 2022, this yield was still ticking over 100% uh, annualized yields for extended periods of time. So, But in order to get this yield, what you had to do was you had to go purchase TOOM. TOOM was this pegged asset. It was pegged to another, another cryptocurrency. So you had to go purchase the pegged asset, hold it on your balance sheet or in a wallet, what it's called, and then deposit that into a liquidity mining protocol. So as you look at this chart of here, uh, it's not a stretch, it's not a logical stretch to assume that the peg was held up by the yield itself. And you could actually see that relationship quantitatively at the time. Uh, so this uh, is a scatter plot where we just simply plotted out the, the correlation between the uh, tomb peg between the, the pegged asset and the changes in yield. And so you can see that positive correlation between the peg and the change in yield. So when yields declined, so too did the peg. And so if we go back just one more slide back to here, if you look in that bottom right-hand corner of, the, of this yield chart, you can see how that yield began to sort of dramatically decline, dramatically and quickly decline. So as that yield became compressed, the peg became shaky, showing signs of left skew. Uh, this is just a plot of the rolling uh, four-week uh, skew for changes in the, in the peg. It's uh, the pegged asset for changes in tomb, the value of tomb. Uh, all of a sudden, the yield market participants were being paid really started to matter. And we began to think as we were looking across the space that many of these liquidity mining trades or opportunities seemed to have a sort of qualitative uh, risk profile similar to carry trades in traditional markets. Now, I'm sure like many of you are aware, uh, but a little bit of background uh, anyway, carry trades in traditional markets tend to have a bit of that left skew profile, meaning that you can make a little bit of money for a long time, and then all of a sudden you get hit with those left tail events where it sort of wipes out all of your gains or even worse. Uh, and so you could see that left skew kind of appearing here as that yield declined, the, the peg began to become shaky, began to become left skew, left skewed, that risk began to emerge. So in real time, there was now some data giving credence to the assumptions that there was this, this risk profile that was similar to a carry trade. And this leads us to UST. Uh, so UST, stablecoin, uh, run on the Terra Luna blockchain. This was created with a unique mint burn arbitrage mechanism uh, to maintain the value of UST to its peg, to the US dollar. And in order to incentivize market participants to hold UST, the Luna Foundation offered a fixed 20% yield via a, a, a lending protocol called Anchor. So you simply buy UST, deposit it into Anchor, and generate this 20% yield. As easy as that. Um, I was just doing some Googling, I wanted to find you know, some kind of a headline or tweet or something that represented animal spirits at the time. And I found this and um, of course, hindsight is 2020, but it's useful to remember that the, many of the brightest got caught up in this trade, um, which we'll see here, which we'll see here in a moment. 
uh, because as these yields became compressed, as I showed these, that example of TUM earlier, uh, as, as sort of a, an example of how these yields were becoming compressed, the demand for UST then increased because they were offering that 20% fixed yield. So here you can see the total UST in existence. This is the market cap, market capitalization of all UST. Uh, just before the collapse, it reached nearly $19 billion uh, in total. Uh, and so under the weight of its own demand, the Luna Foundation and the Anchor Protocol could not meet that 20% fixed interest promise. And after only some minor interest rate reductions where the, the rate was taken down to about 18% in May of 2022, and then there were sort of discussions to take it down to the single digits, um, it didn't take long then for the peg to completely fall apart. And this collapsed suddenly and dramatically with billions of dollars of wealth wiped out overnight. But unfortunately, this had not ended the worst of it. The collapse of UST just brought about contagion because not only had retail been pushed out on the risk spectrum, but also these larger institutional players. Their positions in UST forced them to liquidate other higher quality positions to meet margin calls. And I'm going to warn you now, the next couple slides are uh, overwhelming visuals. They're meant to convey the convolution uh, of the interdependencies that existed at the time. So this chart uh, is from a, a report from a government body from the Financial Stability Oversight uh, Council report. Um, this is uh, this sort of web of the uh, connections to Three Years Capital. Um, Three Years Capital uh, was a digital asset hedge fund. And so you can see Three Years Capital in that dark blue box in the, in the middle here, in the kind of bottom middle. Uh, so Three Years Capital was a digital asset hedge fund and they become massively levered uh, with these sort of shadow loans taken out uh, from various large centralized uh, cryptocurrency lending desks. Uh, so you can see those, those lending desks are sort of these, these lighter blue uh, squares here. So you see Celsius on the top right, Genesis uh, just above them, BlockFi, Voyager down at the bottom. Uh, so there were these, this sort of a web of these essentially shadow loans that were these, these crypto lending desks weren't aware that, that three years had, had taken out these, these loans between all these counterparties. So this contagion, this, this rippled through the market like this, this domino effect. And so you can see here, uh, this is a just a chart. Uh, this the the price line, the the blue line here. This is just the value of uh, the top 100 DeFi uh, tokens, and uh, you can see here that there are just sort of various events that are uh, with these arrows pointing pointing along the the uh, timeline of, of prices. And this is just to demonstrate that interconnected web of of interdependencies that we showed in the last slide, how that actually manifested itself through time and in the markets with these uh, stablecoin DPEGs hacks that are uh, that occurred as well. And, and also these, these blue events or these, these macro fallout, or essentially uh, a lot of this was a uh, centralized crypto desks um, having to shut down. And one other thing that I do wanna mention here is that this is sort of a bonus point for allocators. And I do think this is important. Um, is that it seems as though anecdotally uh, that the balance sheet shocks were far beyond what is mainstream knowledge. I mentioned this in, those, in the takeaways at the very beginning of the presentation. Many digital asset funds, uh, businesses, uh, protocols invested their treasuries into uh, UST much more than what we've seen in, in headlines. This combined with the general downward pressure on prices and volatility spikes caused many to close their doors. And, and I think it'll be interesting over the next uh, several months to see um, just what those impacts uh, look like as, as more detailed reports come out. So this moves us forward in the timeline into Q3. So what stands out from this? In the midst uh, of all the collapses, we were able to see 
would DeFi protocols could stand up to this market environment, could stand up to this stress. And one of the things that I personally love about being involved in digital assets is like is that it operates in dog years. The saying sometimes a decade happens in a week is especially true for these markets. So again, showing that chart of TVL, total value locked, the value of the assets on these blockchains. We asked that question, is DeFi dead in 2022? Was this just an, an interesting yet you know, unfruitful experiment? And yes, there have been huge outflows from DeFi, but you can see it looks as though it sort of has leveled out. We'll see what the future holds. Um, but even though there've been these outflows, even though there have been these market catastrophes, we can sort of think about this like a wildfire that burns away overgrowth and leaves behind the sturdy survivors. So too did we get to see which DeFi protocols withstood the stress. Uh, over collateralized, decentralized stablecoin protocols. So this is in contrast to something like UST, which was an under collateralized, used a totally different mechanism to maintain the peg, over collateralized decentralized stablecoin protocols like MakerDAO and its stablecoin DAI, which is shown here, effectively maintain the peg. Uh, so here you can see the price of DAI, the stablecoin, through the year, and it rarely deviated but a few basis points. Also, uh, decentralized exchanges like Uniswap and Curve, they kept running. There weren't any pauses, uh, circuit breakers that halted trading. And this chart shows the trading volumes at Uniswap uh, V3. Um, so you can see it, it kept going. Yes, volumes have declined, but it's kept running. And all of this stands in contrast to traditional financial markets, where when catastrophic events happen, uh, lawyers have to get involved. Term sheets have to be reviewed. Lawsuits are placed. But for these DeFi protocols, the smart contract is the contract itself. The code is the logic. The balance sheets are public. Uh, you can audit them programmatically and immediately by anyone who desires to do so. Uh, we can say from our experience that we were able to underwrite on-chain assets and take a, take a look at exactly what was backing the value of these things. And we could do this in ourselves in a, in a trustless, uh, verifiable way. So given this background so far, where do we go from here? And what are some potential trends happening on chain? Now, this is my last slide. And this is really just a smattering of some bullet points, some ideas uh, that I think could be useful. Um, because of course, you know, I think so many of us in the financial markets, we like to think about the future sort of like a, as a distribution of potential futures as sort of like a Monte Carlo simulation that goes out. So these are just some, some final points to think about as we have told this story of what has happened so far and, and sort of what can flow through here. Well, one, the line between centralized finance and decentralized finance has begun to become a bit blurred. Um, for example, the MakerDAO, the, the DAI stablecoin that I showed earlier, uh, MakerDAO has passed a proposal to move its a portion of its treasury assets to Coinbase, a centralized entity where Coinbase is going to manage those treasury assets to generate additional yield. Um, so this is a DeFi protocol moving its assets to a centralized entity. Uh, and this flows uh, then into under and uncollateralized credit. These could be, uh, just to throw out some names here, something if you're interested you could look into later, but things like Maple Finance or TruFi, these are on-chain, under collateralized credit protocols where you can deposit your, your assets or your stable coin, your, your dollars into this DeFi protocol, but then it's managed by a centralized entity. Uh, additionally, as we talked about earlier, DAI, the over, stabilized, uh, over collateralized stable coin, uh, maintained its peg through the year. Now there are more over collateralized stable coins uh, being introduced uh, using interest bearing collateral uh, as what backs them, as what backs the peg. Additionally, some other, some other topics that have been popular lately have been interest rate swaps and, and fixed in instruments. Um, uh, and this, this is all on-chain on chain products. Additionally, uh, derivatives uh, 
and various structured products that consume baskets of derivatives and deliver them as a single line item uh, to the user, all done on chain. This can also include things like uh, staked ETH, various uh, staked token protocols. So that uh, concludes the presentation from here. Again, this was uh, these these last bullet points was really just to give you a um, uh, flavor of what to think about from here. And so uh, happy to go in depth into any of these topics or anything that you'd like to talk about uh, in the Q and A or 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 separately. So from there, I'll, I'll pass it over to Charlie. Thank you so much, Phil. Um, one one question I had, and, and apologies if you if you covered this, but or if this isn't um, kind of on topic, but the the Ethereum change um, in in the way they they you know it function. Forgive me, my my verbiage is is not not correct, but you know. What are your thoughts on that and, and kind of the outlook for that change or impact of that change across kind of the, the decentralized finance, you know, ecosystem, so to speak? That's a, that's a good question. So uh, just a little brief background on that. Previously, uh, Ethereum was, had this, uh, what's called a consensus mechanism uh, called proof of work. And proof of work was basically just had a bunch of computers. You could imagine just like these server farms everywhere that are running to make Ethereum work. I'm sorry, did I say Bitcoin there? I meant to say Ethereum. But um, you have all these server farms running basically to make Ethereum work. And it's moved to a new mechanism called proof of stake, which is this, um, uh, you can almost think about it as like this probabilistic game where if you hold uh, a certain number of Ethereum, you can then stake them or plug, you just imagine depositing them in a way, and then you generate an interest rate, and you then have a chance to participate in this, what's called a consensus game, a consensus mechanism. Um, so I, I think going back to what I mentioned earlier with this sort of like this line, this blurring line between CFI and DeFi, um, the while proof of stake, there are many benefits that people mention, like usually like environmental benefits and this sort of thing. Um, from the perspective of like how centralized are the the now these these participants that maintain the network, how centralized are they? It looks like it it might actually make the the network a little more centralized. So there's really only a few players that hold the majority of the tokens and, and do that. So like why why is this important? Um, uh, recently the uh, U.S. government placed Tornado Cash onto an OFAC list, so it becomes so they sanctioned a protocol. Tornado Cash was a, a protocol that um, allowed users to essentially deposit. You could deposit your funds into it, and then you could sort of mix your funds with other folks' assets, and then pull your funds out and kind of obfuscate whose whose funds were whose. So the U.S. government placed that on a sanctioned list, and uh, now that all of these uh, uh, staking all of these entities that are staking the Ethereum are all kind of like more centralized. Well, it, now it becomes a lot easier to enforce that, that sanction list because you just go tell those, those entities that are staking Ethereum, you just say, don't approve anything that uses these blacklisted things, that uses these blacklisted addresses and whatnot. Um, uh, so that, that certainly uh, comes out of that. Um, Aside from that, uh, there are, and I sort of mentioned this a little bit on the on that last slide. We mentioned derivatives and structured products. A part of that sort of like derivatives and structured products are uh, uh, tokenized staked Ethereum. So you have your native Ethereum. You can then go stake it, and now it becomes interest generating Ethereum, essentially. And then you can go get a receipt token, uh, a receipt cryptocurrency against your staked Ethereum. And so now you have this, this receipt token, which then you can take around DeFi and use across DeFi as say like collateral. And so now you have this interest bearing piece of collateral that you can then deposit, take out a loan against it, do this sort of stuff. And it can be used to back other assets as well. Um, so hopefully that's useful. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. So another question we, we got in, how do you think that regulators will react 
to DeFi ecosystems? Will they allow this parallel financial system to exist partially or fully? Yeah, yeah. And that's, um, again, like this bifurcation, right? There's sort of like this, these, uh, depending on how far down the rabbit hole you want to go, if you want to put it that way, uh, essentially how far down crypto Twitter you want to go, you'll find these sort of like enclaves of groups that are, you know, sort of like uh, DeFi zealots that are like uh, decentralized zealots, essentially. Um, but a part of that does flow through into the actual development of certain products in the space. So there are products that are totally immutable in the sense that you can't change the contract code at all and people just interact with them, right? And in fact, that's that's actually largely most of the space right now, but that's where this bifurcation comes. And there's more of these sort of like permissioned products being created. And so there, there are quite a few like uh, Aave, for instance, has a permissioned uh, lending uh, protocol. I can't remember what it's called, but but you can you can look that up later. So they have like the open one, oh, the open Aave that anybody can interact with. And they have this, this permissioned, Ave, where you have to become whitelisted. You have to go through KYC and this sort of stuff to interact with it. Um, uh, and of course, we do uh, hear from folks that, you know, KYC is something that they think about in this in this ecosystem. And it sort of takes a new way to think about things. Yeah. Great. One other question is Digital Opportunities Group building any other software for the management of these assets, Spike looks interesting. Yeah, so we have, um, uh, so our, our, our core product that, that we've built out for, and, and to be clear, we are consumers of our own product. We built out a portfolio management software platform called uh, Spot. So Spot, this is a platform where we can uh, get direct position level, uh, risk management views on our assets, historical performance, this sort of stuff. Um, allows for very granular real-time risk management of our on-chain uh, and, and, uh, and off-chain positions, so positions at, at centralized uh, counterparties as well, sort of aggregates all this, all, this, all this data, and then we sort of wrap up spike into that, wrap up our, our, uh, our yield data sets into that, into that as well, um, but this, this is, this is the, the technology that we built out ourselves, and it's all in-house, yeah. Great. Phil, there, there are no other questions, but this has been really, really interesting. Um, any final thoughts you want to share before we wrap up? No, uh, I appreciate everybody making the time. Um, if you have uh, any uh, more questions, if anything comes to mind, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out. The, you know, our contact info is, is in this document, so, and we'd be happy to, uh, happy to discuss whatever's, whatever's on your mind. Um, sorry, one question just came in. I have clients that ask me a lot about crypto. Do you offer info sessions for local groups? Uh, we, we'd be happy to, to have discussions about that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Phil. Really appreciate it. Thanks to everyone who connected with us today. Please look for an event survey that will hit your email inbox. Um, and I believe perhaps the presentation as well, but I hope everyone has a good rest of your day and thanks Phil for your time, appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for everybody. Thank you.